conditions on these front lines are terrible. Extreme snow, the average nightly temperature is down in the teens. Troops are, are falling to frostbite and exposure. More meals are at a, they're, they're a luxury because they can't cook up here. Fires are re reveal them. And the supply lines are very much constrained. So what you're going to see is that you're going to have to use mules and donkeys to resupply the troops on both sides because this is alpine fighting. Trucks can't make it up there. So you need to have this supply line constantly rejuvenated. Well, how much can a donkey carry? A couple of sacks up the hill? Or a mule? A little more? This is not exactly the greatest way to go about it. And the Italians, which thought they had this great advantage with these things, they called them tankettes. These are like little armored cars. Let me show you what a tankette looks like. This is 60 seconds. Of course, we got to sell things here. That's a tank yet. That's significantly smaller than your minivan. And it had a crew of two. One person drove, the other one shot. And the metal on that thing is not probably much thicker than uh, your 55 Chevy. Not exactly uh, luxurious inside there either, is it? A couple of pedals and a seat and, uh, and there's no window. There's a slot where you look out of it, so the bullets could fly through the slot. And that says it all. Fast and expensive, thin armor. So not very good for this campaign, not very useful. So it's not the breakthrough weapon that Mussolini had planned. So that's the supply line. That's an Italian Alpen troop and his mule sitting in a river trying to ford a river in November and December. I imagine that water probably was about 40 degrees. You get wet when it's 40. The next step is probably hypothermia pretty soon. Huh? So there was a lot of exposure issues. Now this is what they're bumping up against. The Greeks had been developing along their borders, especially along the, the border with Bulgaria, these huge armored installations. They've been putting their money into fixed and fixed situations. And they've been training up here. So this has been an advantage to them. So Hitler doesn't want to get involved, but he sees his friend getting in trouble. In 1940, November, he starts planning behind the scenes. What if the Italians don't make it? And he's furious in a way with Mussolini, having been left out of the decision making and now having to go in and mop up. And he realizes he's got to take care of this because if he doesn't, the British are going to reinforce through, Brit, uh, through Greece, and eventually they'll be within striking distance of the oil fields in Ploesti. This was not part of the plan. He didn't need to do this. Mussolini left him exposed. Now, how does this play in the West? Well, for the British, they're enthused. Finally, they can start relieving some of the pressure off of them. Remember, the Battle of Britain is still continuing, and now the Greeks are on a rampage. This is going to take a little pressure off of, off of them because Hitler will have to reallocate aircraft and prize troops. Now also, we, we know that both FDR and Churchill love this because it's the first democracy that's held its own. Everybody pulled it up pretty quickly. The Greeks will actively fight against the Italians from October through April, early April. 
and they will only have their problem when Hitler decides to attack them on April 6th. And he will attack Yugoslavia and Greece at the same time. And he will exploit a hole in the line caused by the fact that the Greeks have taken all their troops and faced them over in Albania, and they've also put a contingent behind what they call the Metaxas line, this fortified wall that faces Bulgaria. But they left a big hole facing Yugoslavia. That's supposed to be filled by the British, but the British aren't at the same line with the Greek troops. They're behind the lines 60 miles with less than 40,000 men. Hitler charges through in a blitzkrieg action, and they cut off the Greek army, both the eastern component and the western component in Albania. Remember, the Greeks were hesitant to pull back because if they pull back, what's going to happen? The Italians will come forward. So they're caught. And what happens is the second largest Greek city will fall on April 9th, Thessaloniki. Half a million inhabitants at the time. Approximately 40% are non-Greeks, including a very significant population of Jews. Sephardic Jews that had left because of the diaspora and other events in Eastern Europe. So the British will have to stop gap and try to keep the, the, the Germans out. They'll make two attempts, one at Serbia, and the next one they'll go to the historical battlefield of Thermopylae. And unlike Leonidas, they didn't die fighting to the last man. They withdrew. Remember, Britain is in this to slow down the Germans. They're not actively engaging. They're not going to try to stop them. They don't have enough units. So they pull back through the Peloponnesus, and then they leave late April, and they get taken out to Crete, where they're going to make another attempt at holding the island of Crete. So you see they exploit it. Oh, they exploit this gap right here. They come right through the center between the two sets of lines, and they uh, are able to cut the, the units in two. So the British pull out April 28th, they reassign, reassemble in Crete. 30 days later, the Germans will attack them there using a combined airborne and naval operation. For the first time, they will use paratroopers. This is the first massive deployment of paratroopers. Well, we have to also understand the technology of paratrooping. Parachutes are not like they are today. They were rather primitive. You got kicked out of the plane, you floated down, and you didn't carry your rifle with you. The rifles are dropped separately in boxes and you were supposed to catch up with the rifles on the ground because you needed your hands to steer the parachute. And those parachutes came down so violently, something like 40 to 50 percent were injured or killed upon hitting the ground. The casualty rates of the paratroop units were upwards of 80 percent in some cases. And it didn't assist them that once they hit the ground, British and the Greeks pounced on them. There's many cases where Greek women and men, little old peasants, would come out with pitchforks and whatever to off the German because they knew he didn't have a gun in many cases. He's looking for his weapon, which may have dropped farther away. So this is not exactly a good idea. The other thing that we also see is the British have also begun to break the code. They know what the, the Germans are doing, but they don't put them all together yet. It's going to be later in the war that the breaking of the ultra code is going to work to their advantage. But nonetheless, the Germans with their airplanes are still devastated. And when they bring the ships across, the Germans are able to sink four British battleships and, and 
um, not destroyed, but damaged 10 others. It's one of the costliest days for the British Navy, the Battle of Crete in World War II. And clearly, it's a, a sizable loss. Britain has to pull out. If they can't pull out, and it woes a lot of men on Crete. And Crete falls rather quickly. It's a three to four day battle. Most of the units land here in the eastern sec or the western section, and they move across rather easily. And most of the evacuation is done through Heraklion. 4,000 Brits are taken out and sent to Egypt to backstop. But what's the legacy? 219 days the Greeks have taken on Germany and Italy. This is the longest that any allied country to this point has been actively resisting, and they've won. So that's all I got for you tonight. I'll hold, let's hold questions. I know you've got questions. Mr. Budimir will come up, and then we'll have a question session. Can we give Mr. Manny on